Uh, my name is Anna Schumann. I was born and raised about a mile and a half west of, uh, of um, Lake Michigan. I grew up on a farm, went to a nearby high school in Port Washington, and after that I went to St. Mary's School of Nursing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right on the lake. After three years of school, I took my state boards and passed so I could practice. And they invited me to work in the operating room, which I really liked, and so I did. I graduated from nursing school in September. Now we're in December and we're in the middle of somebody's, um, in the middle of an operation. And I was working with two surgeons that were very good. And they, I thought they were old because they were in their 40s. And uh, all of a sudden another surgeon came running in with just a mask to his face. He said, guys, they bombed Pearl Harbor. And in my head I'm saying it was December 7th. In my head I'm saying, where is Pearl Harbor? So we finished up the case and then I went up to the room where you clean up. And I found out where Pearl Harbor was. And they were right, they were drafted. They had their kids in boarding schools and they got new cars and they, they knew it would be drafted. With any luck they'd probably go in as a captain, which was nothing like the money they were making. So that went on and I kept on working in the OR and I had a friend that worked on the surgical floors and they kept on the radio and, and in the newspaper they were yelling for, crying for nurses. So I said to my friend, Pee Wee, how about a little adventure? She said, I'm for it. I said, well, maybe we could get to see the world. Maybe we get to go to see Paris and Rome. And besides, that would be a patriotic thing to do. So we, that's what we did. And we went down and we signed up. I think it was Camp Grant. And they counted our eyes and our ears. Uh, it was supposed to be a physical. <laughs> and of course, we passed. And, um, and then uh, they said um, they'd give us our orders. They'd come by the mail, and they did. And we were ordered to Wichita Falls, Texas, Shepherd Field. It's now called Shepherd Air Force Base, but it was a field then. At that time, you see, we didn't have an Air Corps. We just had an Air Force. So they put, we got on the train in Milwaukee. Neither of, one of us had ever had a train ride. And they gave us an upper and a lower berth. And because she was short, she had to go on top. But she didn't. We sat down in the bottom berth and talked the night away, watching the lights go by and wondering what the heck was going to happen. And then pretty soon we get to Wichita Falls. And we called the base like we were told to. And they said, no. <clears throat> You can't come today. We're not ready for you. Check and at such a hotel. I don't remember the name. And we'll pick you up in the morning. And we'll pay the expenses. That sounded good. So we went, checked in at the hotel. See, it's October. And in Milwaukee, it was already fall. And it was kind of cold. And it was so hot there. And we, had, we were wearing wool suits. So we couldn't wait to get up to our room and get some air conditioning. And we looked around. There was no air conditioning button to push. There was just a big old ugly fan swirling around up on the ceiling. So we called down to room service and said, say, our air conditioning isn't working. Oh, yes, it is. You can turn that fan to high or low. Well, we turned it to high. It didn't. So they said, well, in that case, send us up a Tom Collins. We thought a nice cold drink would be nice. Can't do that either. The town went dry a month ago. So we got a Coke, and we spent the night, and we had dinner, and they came and got us the next day to Shepherd Field, Texas. They looked at my record and found out I'd worked in the operating room, so immediately, that's where they sent me. I was going to be an OR nurse in the Army, and Pee Wee worked on the wards. Our chief nurse was, she was really a fine lady, but she was a tough, regular Army, a graduate of Texas A&M. And she looked at us in the eyeballs and she said, listen, as long as you do your job right, you'll never have any trouble with me. But if you bring disgrace to the Army Nurse Corps, you're going to be in big trouble. Yes, ma'am. So we gave us our room, there were barracks. I went to work in the operating room. Well, we didn't do any female operations, but we did all various kinds of operations with the fellows that got hurt. And interesting enough, a lot of them, uh, they were inspected every month. 
decided they needed a circumcision and they didn't want to have that done at home, so they thought they'd get it done there. <clears throat> but they were sorry. They were not very comfortable. And they got hurt on obstacle courses and emergencies like that. So we were there about six months, and I decided we started uh, in the mess hall. They had a big sign where you could sign up for overseas assignment. And we signed up all the time. And the chief nurse called us in and she said, look, you haven't given me any trouble. I don't send nurses away that give me, don't give me any trouble. So um, you're going to stay right here. That's what you're going to do. I send the troublemakers away. Well, the dear soul went on leave for a month. And while she was gone, it was posted. And we got our names up there and we were out before she came back. We had a grand party the night before we left and my friend fell and broke her, sprained her ankle. And she couldn't walk. But one of the people celebrating with us was an orthopedic surgeon who I helped work with about two times a week. He was very good. He said, don't worry, bring her to my office in the morning and I'll inject her with Novocaine and she can get on the train which we did and she did. And when we got to Fort Carson, we, Camp Carson, we said she'd stumbled over a suitcase. That's what we said, because she still couldn't walk. So I, we spent some months there, and they were getting our unit together, and we were going to be the 251st Station Hospital. And I was still in the operating room, and she was still on the surgical floors. And we were there about three months. And we, were, we couldn't leave the grounds any fur further than 10 miles. Uh, but we saw all the sites that were around, and so it was, it was pleasant. We marched every day, climbed mountains, did the obstacle courses, did the gas mask stuff, and um, came out of that alive. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, we were on alert, and they took us to the train, and it was a troop train. And we were going down to California. And I said to my friend, this doesn't look like the direct, right direction to go to New York, to go to Paris. And she said, yeah, I don't know. So I get to a place called, I think Camp Stoneman, I think was the name of it, near San Francisco. And we were locked up. We couldn't call anybody, nothing. And then pretty soon they said, send, uh, send your winter clothes home. So then we knew we weren't going to go where we thought we might. So pretty soon, they said, be ready the next day. Uh, by that time, we had all been issued a musette bag where our gas masks were in. And there was room in there for your canteen of water and a bottle of beer, if that's what you wanted. And um, so we'd get dressed up in our dress clothes, lined us up, and marched us down the street to the dock. And the people were waving flags. And we thought, that's pretty great stuff. And we got on the ship. And we were assigned quarters, and we were on E-deck, and they put us, E-deck was a torpedo level. And they were all nailed shut because of that. So they put one, six of us in a room that ordinarily would hold two, three in each deck. And uh, some of them got air, uh, seasick. So what we did was we took our Mae Wests and our gas masks and a pillow and a blanket, and we went and slept on top deck. We were allowed to do that. Only problem, you had to get up at 4.30 a.m. because, you know, they washed down the decks every morning at that time. So we did get some sleep. All went well. It only took 13 days. This ship was a Matsonian. It was a, a luxury liner peacetime. And they turned it into a troop ship. And if we thought we had it back, I looked back one time and looked down into an open doorway, and that's where the GIs were. And that was awful. They were stacked there about four deep, no windows, no nothing, and I thought, I'm not going to complain. They gave us very, very good food. That they did. So after 13 days, which is a short time from San Francisco to Brisbane, Australia, we landed and we, um, they put us out and looked to me like a big pasture outside the city of Brisbane. There were cows around and frogs and snakes and all that stuff. And there were tents, 15 to a tent. And so that's where we lived. And down from our tents was a great big, like you might say, slab of wood with about 10 sinks in it. And that's where you, you know, you washed up in the morning and you brushed your teeth. 
down a little further was a latrine, and they were just johns without doors and without tops. And um, the showers also were just one temperature. But you know, that's semi-tropics there, so that wasn't so bad. But we learned early on to shake out our shoes because the frogs like to get into your shoes. And so um, every time you went out, you had to sign out. And uh, that meant that if you were hurt, and then you were hurt in the line of duty. And if you didn't sign out, you weren't. So um, one night, we decided to explore Brisbane. And there's a tram, it's a little train. And it took about half hour to get to Brisbane. And we got to Brisbane, there were about five of us. And um, there were all kinds of pubs, but women were not allowed in pubs. But we'd been told that there was an American center there where the uh, nurses and um, all the officers could go. And they always had a band and plenty to drink. And so we decided we'd head for there. Well, we were barely inside when someone yells, hey, Penny, and it was a fellow I knew at Shepherd Field. He and his date and my date and I used to double date. So right, right away we had someone to take us around because he had a Jeep. So one night he brought us home to we forgot to sign up, we honestly did. And the nurse, our nurse was not in charge of the camp. There are a bunch of nurses there that were going to different places. But we had one there that evidently had a problem with her eyes and they kind of popped and we didn't like her. And she was a very unattractive lady and very uncharitably we called her Popeyes. But anyhow, so, we were out that night, we forgot to sign out. We came in and she arranged two lamp posts. They were not, we didn't have much electricity, but, and, and that's, if you came in with somebody, you had to park there and get out of the car right away, no necking allowed between those. So we got in there and we got out and we were getting out when this fellow who was officer of the day, he was a captain, came up and said, you're in trouble, you're not parked in the right place. And Al said, well, we're only a few feet off. The light is right there. He said, no, they're not, you're not parked right, and they're in trouble, and I want their names. And he's motioning behind his back, and we took off into the woods. And he said to the two GIs with him, you go after those girls. I want their names. Well, we ran through the weeds and everything and got back to our tent, took our shoes off, jumped into bed, pulled our covers up, tucked the mosquito net in, and we could hear them jumping through the woods. And our tent mates knew, but nobody said a word. Pretty soon he gave up. The next day, he was down there at um, mess hall, see if he could see us. So for about two or three days, they brought food into us. So that was all over with. And while we were there, I was so mad at that, at, that head nurse. Um, Al took me out to some place where they were arresting pilots, either to go back to combat or go back to the States. And there was a guy there that flew A-20s. And he said, would you like to have a ride? We said, sure. And we want you to do one thing. We want you to buzz her tent where she lives. And he did. And you can imagine what that sounded like. She came running out trying to read the number, tried to get someone to help her, and nobody would. And, but when we got back, they had a little turret in the back where the gunner was. And I stood up there, and I would and my friend was in the front, and I got scared, and my shirt was just ringing back, and all of a sudden I felt somebody pull my pant leg and said, Lieutenant, we're coming in for a landing. You better sit down. And all the time there had been a sergeant there, but I didn't know it. So I sat down, and I got off there. I just pulled out my blouse to dry off. So we went to eat, and that fellow who did the flying, his hands were shaking so badly, he could hardly cut his meat. And that was our pilot. So... He was on his way home, that's for sure. But anyhow, so that's a guy who got a ride on an A-20. And after that, it got too cold. We're in June, we're semi-tropics, Brisbane is. And they couldn't find enough stoves to heat our tents. So they made a deal with a um, convent on the outskirts of Brisbane. And it was a Catholic convent that we could stay there, but we could only have Catholic services in their chapel because it was consecrated. Well, for those of us who were Catholic, that was a wonderful thing. We just could go down there, you know, in our pajamas if we wanted to. So there were about 
five of us to a room, very crowded. And on the walls were stuff like, God is watching, Jesus is listening, God bless you. And we're sitting on our couches drinking beer. <laughs> so that went, that went on all right. And down at the bottom of the hill where you caught a bus to go to town, they, I don't know what you call it, but it was a building where they kept cockatoos. And the GIs were taking care of them. And you know, every sentence they started was the effing word. And I often wondered what happened when the nuns came back. I don't think they kept those cockatoos. But anyhow, after a while, we were put on alert and we were put on a ship. It was a Tasmanian, it was a Dutch ship. And that took us to Buna Beach, New Guinea. And we were only there about two weeks. And then a hospital ship came. No, he came back and then he took us to New Britain. And New Britain is um, an island uh, north of uh, New Guinea. And to the left of it always is a place called Finchhaven. That's where MacArthur was headquartered. Anyhow, they got us there. And we weren't there but two nights. And our chief nurse came and said headquarters was throwing a party. And I wondered how we'd go. And we said, no, <clears throat> we didn't want to go. And so she rounded up about 10 who said, she'll go if I'll go. Finally, she said, if I, I'll get an ambulance. This was our own chief nurse. She was only five years older than the rest of us, and she was a lot of fun. So we said, we'll go. So we went to that dance, and they had a little band, and they had been, the, the first half of the floor was very careful. And the second time, they were hurrying because they heard the nurses were finally coming. And they must have had about an inch space between those planks. And, and they were drinking, I guess. But you see, they also had the Army Corps of Engineers there, so they could get things. And they got an old beat-up refrigerator that worked. And they had a stage. Anyway, we got there and we sat down. And I noticed this guy coming toward me, and I said to Krieg, he's going to ask me to dance. I got it in my bone, feel it in my bones. See if he's taller than I am. And so she said, OK. So she nodded her head, yes, he was taller than I was. And so he brought me back to where he picked me up. And then he asked her to dance. Then he came back and asked me to dance again. And I noticed he had wings on. And I said, I thought this was artillery. How come you're carrying wings? It turned out he was a liaison pilot, a spotter pilot. He said, would you like to see my plane? And without thinking, I said, sure. Well, it's right this way, ma'am. It took me out. And we were in the middle of the jungle with a little path. They, they, they had, you have to use a machete to cut your way through the jungle. It's so dense, and the weeds are so high. And there was this little path, and there stood this little plane, and it was called Little Anopheles. And I thought, boy, this is really stupid. I could get into trouble. And I eyed how far back I had to go, and I'm a pretty good runner, and I thought, well, I could probably make it back if this guy gets out of control. But he was very nice. And he walked me back and, and asked if he could take me home, and I said, no. I'd go with who I came. And he said, well, that's probably right, but can I call you up? And he did, and after that it was history. That's the guy I married to for 52 years. So we saw each other every day. I know when we were on the Britain, that's where I met my husband, that was a very costly win for the Marines. I don't know how many were killed there. So we got the old Marine officers' quarters, but they were still sort of a modified tent. And but we had a um, screen window, and there was a fence around because there was a jungle all around us. And we had a door, and the door was a screen door, but it had some wood to hold it together. And I'm a very, very light sleeper, always was. But my roommate, we were told never to go down to the bathroom or the latrine area alone at night because the jungle was right there, and we did not have guards around us. We had, there was a fence, but that was it, and a couple of lights. And our chief nurse wanted more lights, and they said they didn't have any. So we were told never, she always had to make a trip to the bathroom at night. So this night, she didn't. I was woke up, and I thought, that, that's funny. And I heard this big rumble, a terrible noise, and a yell. And I ran to the screen door, and then a, a small person in a fatigue with a hat pulled down over his head ran past me, 
to, I, I was second to the end of the hallway, and the chief nurse was at the end of the hallway, ran past her and jumped the fence and into the jungle. So we ran down to see. We were told never to sleep in the nude, never to sleep in a nightgown, always go to bed in pajamas, because if you had to make a runaway, you could move faster. Well, it was, you know, it was a hot night, and she decided she'd sleep in the nude. And whoever it was knew her roommate was not there. She was alone. She was lying on her stomach, and I don't know, I think he hit her with a big rock on the head. A big, big gash. And she had a big head of hair like Jackie Kennedy twice a war. I ran down there, and the chief nurse came down with me. I said, I might as well stay here. They got the... Uh, the boys from the, that were on call in the opera room over with a litter. And uh, we took her over to the opera room. I don't know how many stitches we took in her. But you know, she came through it just fine. But they never did find who did it. And guess what? The next day we were lit up like Christmas. All of a sudden they found some gas, found some light bulbs. And my boyfriend, my husband-to-be, the big winner, gave me a 45, but he took the clip out. I said, oh, that's great. What am I going to do with the dumb 45 without a clip? And he had taken me out to the pistol range, and I could shoot it, but I could barely hit a circle. And he said, they see you standing there weaving, holding that gun. <laughs> They're going to take off. So I had a pistol, but I had no clip. So I gave it back to him. See, there you couldn't go out with an off. We couldn't all go out with officers. And they had to carry the guns. And I always thought we should have carried the guns, but that's not how it worked. He was so lucky. He was walking across to his airplane one night. And it's, I, I'm telling you, the Japanese people are so small. And they threw out a hand grenade, landed right, right at his foot. And it was a dud. It didn't go off. And then number two, uh, they were in, um, in Luzon, near Manila. And he was going to, they, it was his turn to take watch that night to see these planes could fly so low that the big guns couldn't hit them. But small guns could hit them. And they were on a reconnaissance mission to see where the positions were, and they'd call that back to the artillery. And he was just about to climb into his plane when his buddy said, don't go, uh, so-and-so is going to go with me. We're just going to fool around anyhow, and we'll take a look. And they got shot down. I mean, he came home in a body bag. So, you know, we were lucky. We had 50 good years, and he was sick for two years. And that was it. So in the meantime, he was one of the three divisions that went with MacArthur to retake Luzon. That's the island on which Manila is. And the Japanese were expecting them to come in through, like, Corregidor and that area. But MacArthur, for all of his pompous ways, was a good strategist. He came north. He came north of Lingayen and came in through Lingayen Gulf and worked his way down. So in the meantime, they sent us up on a hospital ship. And uh, we stopped at an island not far from Luzon called Leyte. The Philippines has a bunch of little islands. And they were so desperate for help that we went to work. And it rained and rained and rained, and we wore boots to work, took them off because they were so muddy, and, and worked. And so we were only there about 10 days, but we worked hard. But, and the drinking water there was a big lister bag. It's like a big canvas bag with a spigot, and they put so much medication in it. It was really bad stuff. And, but anyhow, after that, they came in these little landing barges and loaded us up and took us up to Lingayen Gulf. And when we got there, uh, they split us up. Some went here and some went there. Some stayed right there. And I was with a group that went to a, what they call the 360th Hospital. And we were still definitely in a combat zone. And um, the GIs did a wonderful job, and they were so tired. Um, they'd just been working days and nights, so they were glad to see us. And they had our tents up. There were seven, eight of us to a tent. And they had our foxholes. They were big enough to hold four of us. And um, there was a guard around us. And um, 
almost every place the army went, they found an old school building. Now, the, the patients in the surgical and medical wards were in tents, and there was just grass on the floor. But they always seemed to find an old school building, and that's what they had there. So we had a real floor, and the roof was kind of messed up, so they put a tarp over that. And we had some windows, and they had black curtains to put over it in case of a blackout. And we had generators, and we had a sterilizer. So, and we had um, two operating rooms and a place to do supplies. Let me ask you, Penny, um, some of the duty that you did close to the front line, um, were they somewhat like the MASH units that we've seen? I knew TV? that was coming, sort of, but we were really not that bad, morally, that is. Yes, definitely the surgery part was, yeah. Was what? Uh, it was that crude. You know, we didn't have anything. You had to improvise all the time. Oh, yeah. But you must know that we had some very good surgeons. They worked under the same conditions we did. And they were good. I had some that weren't so good, but they weren't at that 7th of Vac. The surgeons at 7th of Vac, uh, they wouldn't have settled just for me to help them. They had their own surgical staff wherever they went stateside. They were that good. They came from Boston someplace. You, you mentioned that uh, these field hospitals that sort of like a mash unit. Did you, did you ever have a shortage of supplies? Did you have enough supplies that you could always work or did you have to scrounge for what you had? Uh, we had supplies. I don't ever remember running out, but we had to make do. Like, we didn't have enough sterilizers or if the wind blew, we had to boil them and carry them in, in baskets and put them on the scrub table. See, ordinarily, you wash the instruments and then you wrap them and then you sterilize them. So, but, you know, the turnover was so fast that we didn't always have time to do that, but we could boil them. So that's what we did. And that's where this guy put me in for the bronze medal. I still don't know why, but he did. Were you close enough to the war zone so that you were entitled to, and did you receive any battle stars? You know those little stars they put on your ribbons? Yeah, I think I got four or five. Five. You want to tell me about that? or? No, they just give them to you. OK. Oh, I did get the bronze star, and I told you. All I know is it said, meritorious achievement and a couple other little things. The, the fun part of that was I didn't know I was going to get it until all of a sudden you said you have to appear at the parade ground at such and such a time and you better put on some fresh slacks because over there you were perspiring all the time. So I did that and I put a clean cap, a cap on. So the chief nurse took me down there and my gosh here were a bunch of so, so, soldiers standing around. Here, here was a base chief nurse here was the base commander, and there stood my boss, uh, Colonel Martin, with a grin from ear to ear, and I figured he'd been up to something. And sure enough, I was called forth, and a General Reynolds put the bond star on me. And I was told to, you know, we could, we could march. We could do all, all the calls. Marched up to him, and I saluted him, and he saluted me. And then he got this medal and gave a nice little talk. And then he was going to pin it on me. And I tell you, I was really skinny in those days. We all were. And he took a hold of my khaki shirt and he pulled it way out. So everybody snickered. And he put it on there and he saluted me and I saluted him and marched back. So when I saw Colonel Martin said, thanks a lot. That was it. And you still have no idea why you got that. Uh, it said all the things I did, meritorious and beyond the line of duty and stuff like that. Was this common that nurses would get this kind of recognition? I knew you would ask. No, I was the only one that got it there. They might have in other battlefields, but I was the only one that got it there. Well, you must have done something right. I guess I did. <laughs> and we worked very hard. We had the only German, the only Japanese prisoners of war on the whole island. And we only had 50. The theory was the GI said the only safe one was a dead one. So that's how it went. 
So every night, the alarm would go up, and here would come the Japanese planes. They'd fly, when we had to go into our foxholes, and we had to take our gas masks. And uh, so we could hear them. They're like a bunch of angry bees. And they flew right over us, never dropped a thing. They were going for an ammunition dump down the road. And they did hit another hospital, but not us. So they knew we had their prisoners. So we lucked out there. For instance, um, we had movies. And they were outdoors. And um, you'd go to the mess hall, and you'd get a wooden box. And that's what you sat on. And they would show the movies. And if it was just a little bit of a rain, and they'd try to shut it down, we'd all yell. And I know that when we were there, several times the alarm, the alert went on, and we had to hit the floor. Things like if you went to church, armed guards went with you. Why? Because Why of the Jap guard? Because of the Japanese. They're small people, and they can hide in those jungles like nothing you've ever seen. They weren't. They were a part of it. They were great jungle fighters. That's how you want to put it. And they weren't very nice fighters. But they were that close to your compound that you were... Oh, yeah. They could get in there. Did they ever at any point? No, not my unit. But down the street they did. They hit it good. A street, I mean, you know, a dirt road, let's put it that way. What happened there? I don't know. They, they hit, uh, and they hit one of the wards, and I don't know if they hit the operating room or not, and some were killed. You know, they didn't exactly publicize that. The states would get, we'd get this paper, say that um, the war was moving on, and just a little mopping up. And when they said that mopping up, that meant <laughs> we were going to get more casualties. But, uh, you know, that's all we did. There was no place else to go. So pretty soon things calmed down there. And then uh, they sent me further down. Now we were really close to the front lines called the 7th Evac, 7th Evacuation Hospital. And um, again, the wards were in tents on grass. And we again had an old school building. Only this time, uh, there were no separate rooms except one. And we had five tables lined up in this one schoolroom. And we treated each one like it was a separate operating room. Like if you were at one table working and I was at my table, you don't come to me for anything. It's like I'm not there. You're a separate case. And so we had pretty good luck with our patients. I didn't, that bothered me, surgery there, because the kids were sometimes 19, 20 years old. And, you knew they weren't going to have that leg again. And, you know, if they got a hit in the ribs, they used a thing called a rib stripper, and that was ugly to see. That was hard to be objective. Also, I gave two anesthetics. I'd never given an anesthetic in my life, and I so informed them. And they said, well, it's you or nobody. So I gave a thing they called sodium pentothal. And no, he didn't die, and I didn't either. But what we did get about but that time they changed those L-4s, those reconnaissance planes, into L-5s. And by, see, we didn't have any helicopters yet. And the L-5s could carry one litter patient. So they, they go right through the front lines, to the clearing station, and load up a person that might not make it. And usually that was somebody with their brains running out of their head. And they'd bring over to us. And that usually was about a five or six hour operation easy. And so, you know, so they were sent to the wards until they were well enough, and then they were sent back side to the states where they could get proper care. But you know, you often wonder, I don't remember what side of the brain all that tissue went and what kind of a person they were after all that. So that was a downside. How long would it take to get somebody from the front back to one of these hospitals where you were, how quickly could they get guys in there? Well, if, with these little um, L5s, oh, I imagine maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. How many nurses uh, 
for a sign with you there? Oh, probably 50 or 60. How many casualties did you get in? Oh, I, I can't, I couldn't answer that. Uh, that was a real hard thing. You know, we were out in this school building there, and there's sort of a, they had sort of a manufactured a ramp. That was at both the places, 360th and 7th of Ac. And they'd bring these kids in, and they'd have tags on their chest uh, see, to tell us what, the, um, what they did on the field for them. Uh, in other words, if they had given them morphine, how much? So we would know not to do that. And you go down that line, and you look at that thing, and you know what? I thank God I never had to do the triage. We were told stateside, you know, you're going to have to do that. And I, they said, which one would you pick first, the guy, guy with, with a big cut in his belly or the one with the arm hanging off? Oh, I'd, say, I'd take the belly guy because he, he needs you the fastest. He said, you're wrong. He said, because he probably won't make it anyhow. You have to pick the guys that has the chance of making it. But I never had to make that decision. There was always some doc around, and he would make the decision. And I know at the, um, at the 360th, they had a bunch of Filipinos lined up, and they were waiting to take them to the morgue. And I was coming back on duty, and I saw this one wiggling his toes. I said, I don't think he's ready for the morgue yet. So they brought him in, but he did die after his surgery. But so. But at least he had a chance. Oh yes. Chance. And we had no, we had no incinerators as such. You take off a kid's leg, what are you going to do with it? So they had big uh, steel drums in the yard, and they built fire in there, and they would burn it. And that was the one time I darn near lost it when I saw a dog run across the yard with some kid's leg. Now, that was just too much. At these hospitals, uh, was the goal to just get them, after the surgery, get them stable and get them off to another hospital? Yeah, that was away? it. That was it. How long would patients typically, typically stay if they didn't have a complication? Oh, uh, well, <clears throat> they'd be in the operating room any place from a half hour to six hours, and they'd go to the tents. And I really don't know. I would imagine two or three more days. And then, of course, you know, they had to get some way to get them transported. That wasn't all that easy either. We had no helicopters. But they did have some kind of ambulances that could make it, makeshift ambulances. So once they left the OR, why, I, I don't know. But that was the program. Uh, in the meantime, my husband had been with that um, MacArthur's thing, and they um, were on the outskirts of Manila. And um, they had seen the, the, I forget the name of that camp they had, where they locked them all up. But he had to fly a general up in our direction, and he found me. So we decided, yes, we'd get married. And I don't know how he did it, but he sent home and got a ring, and it didn't get lost, which was a surprise. But I was now on Luzon, and he was in Iloilo, Penai, which was two islands down. But this friend of mine that was a command pilot said, you get the permission, I'll fly you down. And he flew B-25s. So he and a crew of three got me on board. We landed at Clark Field. And they had a bachelorette party for me, which was kind of fun. And they put me up with a Red Cross worker. And the next morning, they picked me up. And I'm sitting there in a B-25, and we're ready to take off. And Johnny said, oh, oh, we got to wait. And here comes this huge, huge plane. It's the biggest darn thing I had ever seen. And this guy, whoever he was, landed that thing just perfect. Turned out it was an emergency landing, and he lost an engine. Sixty years later, I find out <laughs> it's my neighbor across my, the hallway from me right now, Bill. You, you told us that after 60 years, you ran into Bill again. Uh, Isn't that something? Why don't you give us his full name and tell us whether you recognize him from the previous experience. Explore that a little bit. No, we were sitting there in a B-25, and all I know is this plane was landing, and that pilot 
sat tall and he had dark glasses on. And heck, I was going to get married. I wasn't, I, I wasn't looking to see what he looked like. I know he made a perfect landing because both those guys were pilots and they couldn't get over how he landed that big. And we, nobody had seen him be, be 29 before. But anyway, we were down here at, here at the Sunny Acres having coffee one morning. I don't know, it came up one time and I, Bill mentioned that he flew B-29s. I said, oh, I only saw one and that was at Clark Field. And then he said, what time was that? And I gave him the time frame and he said, that was me. And now he lives across the hall from me. What was his full name? Bill Reynolds. So that was kind of interesting. Anyhow, I went down to Panay, to Iloilo, and the vice president of the Philippines was a fellow by the name of Fernando Lopez. And they were so honored that we'd spend, they asked the, if they had quarters for us to stay at. And their building was not bombed. They said the Japanese used it as headquarters. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, I don't know. But it was a mansion, five stories with a swimming pool and tennis courts. Of course, the swimming pool was messed up and the tennis courts were torn down. And they gave us a suite of rooms on second floor because the plumbing worked there. And the bathroom was all marbled and lined up. And I'm coming from a tent with a barrel with a seat on it. This was quite a shock. And anyhow, so we were there seven days. And we were married in a cathedral. And Dick had arranged for a big reception. We had that. And uh, so then he sent another plane down to pick me up. And he came up to the house and he said, you know, Lieutenant, I can come back in a few days if you want me to. You'd be foolish to leave now. I said, well, then I'd be AWOL. He said, so what? So I said, okay, so what? So I stayed three extra days. And then he came down and picked me up, took me back to Clark Field. And from there, they're going to fly me on an AT-6, which is a small plane, a trainer plane. And we were back up to the 360th. And I, don't, I think the name of it was Colossus or something, the name of the town. Well, my suitcase and I wouldn't fit in. So he threw out the, uh, there's a hole in the side of it where he had a bunch of the electrical things. He, he tried to pull that up, it didn't fit either. So he called his friend over. So the friend flew the suitcase and he flew me. And he flew me to where I needed to go. They asked me if I knew MacArthur. I said, no, not directly. So I went back and joined my old unit where that colonel was that put me in for the Bronze Star. And he said I sh should have stayed longer, so I knew I was not in any trouble. And in the mess hall, they had um, some kind of a victrola or something. They played music, and you could go over there, and we, they threw down kind of a funny wooden floor. You could dance on there. But uh, we used to sit there, and we uh, was a Red Cross working with us, and she had one of those little um, gas stoves. So she could have a fire any time and we boil the coffee, sitting there half the night drinking coffee. And when she left, I got it. But I left it there. Somebody else might have to use it. Sure. And uh, for, I had the first mango I ever had in my life. And you know, you peel those and the army issued you big towels, olive drab in color, and you run downstairs and hold it under the faucet if there was one, or under the shower. And then you, we all snitched a knife from the mess hall and you peel it and the juice would just run down your arms and it was so good. And they also had bananas uh, that were ripe when they were green and we'd get those. But you see, right from where our mess hall was, <coughs> they all had extended roofs and no windows, see, so the rain couldn't come in. And there were, um, the Filipinos were growing some kind of crops there. They were great on tomatoes and greens, but they'd also use it for a bathroom. So, you know, you were really told not to eat that stuff. So, you just plain didn't. They had all kinds of stuff there, but you were afraid to eat it. We were told not to eat anything around there we couldn't peel. And we all took um, Adabrin so we wouldn't get malaria. That, mean you, that means that you wouldn't get malaria as long as you're taking Adabrin, but you wouldn't know we had it until you stopped taking it. So both my husband and I were lucky. We did not get it, but classmates of mine did it and had ended up with permanent liver damage. And um, 
before that, hepatitis. That was bad. Um, there was some amoebic dysentery. If you have amoebic dysentery, the insurances in those days would not insure you because that amoeba just stays hidden all over your body and you live with it. If you had bacillary dysentery, there was a cure for that and you would get insurance. So we were lucky. We came home with health. We had so much to be grateful for. And I like to think I helped a little. Those people had nothing. Those Filipinos that lived in those islands there, they had nothing. A few families had it all, and the most of them had nothing. They lived in huts where they had bamboo floors. They had no plumbing. The floors had little slats in them. That's used that for the bathroom. And it just stayed there. It was just terrible how they had to live. One girlfriend of mine decided she'd go to this beauty shop, so-called, and she thought she'd take a chance and get a permanent. And the first thing this Filipino said, she could speak English. Well, what kind do you have, brown or black? And the girl said to her, what do you mean, brown or black? Well, you know, the lice. Well, she didn't get a permanent. And if they had a burial, they would, um, this was really new. They'd come down the street, and they'd be carrying this little wooden box. Usually it was kids. And then they'd have um, two people walk behind them, and they'd be moaning and yelling and crying all over the place. They were the official mourners. And behind them, they were playing all kinds of jazz music and laughing and everything else. That was the custom. They had the mourners. And then eventually they came and got us. Well, first of all, a general came and we looked pretty bad. And he said he didn't want to send any women back to the States looking like we did. We shouldn't have been over there 18 months. We should have been over there eight months at the longest. So they got a special boat and took us out for boat rides and fixed us all kinds of high calorie meals and make us look better when we went home. So then we went to the outskirts of Manila and waited and waited for a week or two. And then a Liberty ship came and picked us up. And that took 21 days to get back to San Francisco. And then they did a cursory physical there. And um, from there, I think I went to uh, Sheridan was the last place I stopped. And then they, I said goodbye to my friends and I came back to Milwaukee to start married life. And Dick had to have so many points, he didn't have enough points. By that time, he was a major. So we didn't expect him home until Christmas. Maybe, but he made it home Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, to Leadville of all places. And that's where we lived the first five years. And that's about the story. We had four children, nice kids, all grown. I get to Milwaukee, my mother had died just before I went overseas. And my father died when I was in Australia. So the home place was gone. My brother, it was a farm I had married and they were living there and that was fine. But I had a sister in Milwaukee and I went, she met me at the air, at the train station. And um, I went home with her until I could hear from Dick. And then the interesting part of that was he was an only child. And uh, I don't think I'm the one his mother I would have chosen. She thought all nurses were fast, whatever that means. So anyhow, I was there, and then he told me about when he'd be there. And so I thought, well, I'd better go on up. So I went up to Leadville, and I meet this man and this woman. I thought they were so old, they were in their 50s. And we stayed at the Antlers, and that was the old Antlers, which I thought was a real charmer. And so um, we had dinner. And then I pulled out a cigarette. I was still smoking in those days. And immediately, Grandpa left the table. He didn't approve of that. And then Grandma said, oh, you mustn't mind. His daughter smokes, only he doesn't know it. And I thought, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life hiding a cigarette. So I thought, well, I'll just have to get used to it. So the next day, we went up to Leadville. And you know, that's at a 10,500 foot altitude. But physically, I was in very good shape, you know, all that running and training and everything, I was, I was fine. So I was there about five days in which she kept showing me pictures of this girlfriend that Dick had. 
and she was a school teacher, and my, what a nice girl she was. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I won't take, I won't bite on that one. So anyhow, when he came home Christmas Eve night, and then we started looking for a house in Leadville, and we bought one furnished on the sunny side of the street, which is worth $500 more, because the sun melts the snow, and it was furnished. And I'll admit, it was probably not, you know, call a resort type house, but by golly, we could shut the doors and we could have the house to ourselves. It looked great to us. So that's where we started. And we lived in Leadville five years, came to Lakewood, and he was there for some time, and then we went to Greeley. And then he went to Florida, we retired. We traveled a lot. Oh, and by the way, while we were traveling, we went back to the Philippines, and we visited, we got a home with the fellow that was vice president of the Philippines, Fernando Lopez, and they sent a limo to pick us up at the hotel. And we went through three securities to get to his mansion. So you tell me how come he ended up so rich and the rest so poor. What about your uh, nurses? And do, you, do you have reunions? Do you just stay close to some of the... Uh, we did for a long time, but you know what? My best friends died. See, I'm 87. One died last year. She was 89. A couple died a couple of years before. And you will find out when you're that close and living in such close proximity, you're closer to these women than you are to your own family. You lay your life down for any one of them. And so that's, so you, usually there were maybe four that you were very close with and one and two that were best friends. I have another question about some of the reunions. Was there kind of a healing process when you came back? You had to have gone through some awful experiences over there. Was it good to get together with the other nurses afterward? I only went to one reunion and that was at Colorado Springs. And um, some of them came to see me though. And the one that I was best friends with from Minneapolis, she came and spent a week with us. And somebody else spent some time with us. Uh, the reunions, um, well, they would have a reunion, for instance, of the 251st Hospital that we st started in uh, Camp Carson. Um, now we have husbands and wives that we don't know. And the ones you wanted to see were sick or something and didn't come. So that kind of fizzled out. But like I said, we die off. But I miss them. Yes, I miss them. Did you stay nursing after the war? No, I was, uh, by the time I got, uh, got married and got back, I was 25. Dick was 27. He went to work at a bank. <clears throat> and we started our family. I had four children. So I was a stay-at-home mom plus took care of all the neighborhood kids that got hurt. Did you uh, ever talk with any of the other uh, mothers about where you'd been, what you'd done, and could they have any, could they relate at all to the kind of experiences you'd had? Or? No, uh, actually, you know, that was a nice thing Dick and I had between us. We could talk between ourselves. And um, so we really never did because the kids complained about it later on that we never talked about things. But you know, they had such a secure life. Why mess it up? Did you, uh, after the war, you look back on your experience? Did you come away with any particular feeling about the war or your participation in it? Did it have any effect upon your life? I wasn't sorry that I went. I was sorry I didn't get to see Paris or London. But, um, if it did anything for me, it brought to mind the horrors of war. And it's always the young kids. And they're killed just like that. Or they're maimed for the rest of their lives. And you could really go crazy thinking about that. And I was so grateful to be an American and have all the blessings and gifts we were born with, all the privileges.